Hey everyone, it's Jim and Charles from Valves and More, an online vintage tube store. Today in tube lab number 117, we're going to take a first look at rectifiers, or what I'm going to call Rectifiers 101. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Okay, every piece of audio gear that requires power pretty much needs rectification. The reason is simple. Our house mains power of 110 to 240 volts AC is alternating current, and our electronic circuits operate on DC or direct current. Let's take a quick look at a sketch I've made. So, on a scope, if we were to apply um, an electrical source, we would normally start off with the middle line on the scope would be the zero volt line. So there's nothing there at the moment. Let's say we apply plus 12 volts DC or direct current. Our line would move up 12 volts depending on how the scope is segmented and we'd have a straight solid line. That's, that's pure nirvana for audio gear. There's no noise on this, it's just flat as a pancake. Now, alternating current is completely different. So, let's look at the uh, top wave, or the positive 180 degrees. So it comes off of the zero volt line, comes all the way up to 120 volts, all the way down to zero. That's 180 degrees, that's the positive half wave, and of course the negative bottom is another 180 degrees like this. That's that's a full cycle or a full wave and so that's 360 degrees and depending on where you live you're going to have 50 hertz or 60 hertz. Now what the heck does that mean? Well that means that you have 50 cycles per second or 60 cycles per second. And basically the electrons push and come backwards, they move forwards and backwards, they alternate 50 seconds. <laughs> 50 cycles gonna, per second. I knew I was going to go something up. Yeah, they, they do that 50 times a second or 60 times a second. And so you might say to yourself, why the heck don't we have DC supplying house mains? Wouldn't that be simpler? Well, the problem with DC is that it it's a very lossy form of moving electricity around, so you need large gauge wires. And in fact, the very first power system, I believe, was in New York, and Edison set it up, and it was DC. Um, and he did, I think, four square blocks, something like that. And the cable sizes that they had to use to avoid losses um, was incredible. So along comes Tesla, and a, I think a few other engineers, and they realize that if you alternate the current, you can push um, large amounts of current very easily over long distances. So that's why um, all the transmission lines in the world are alternating all the way right up to your wall plug. And that's where we're going to what we're going to be talking about today is what happens after the wall plug. Now, are you going to have 120 volts DC peak to peak? No. Actually, this is the usable portion. You can actually find about 180 volts, or if you're at 240 volts, you're going to have much more than 240 volts. But for the purposes of discussing about this, this is just we're taking the nominal voltage. So nominally, it's 120 volts. And of course, if you're in Europe or a 240 volt region, or 230 is more common, actually, your, your sign is going to be twice as twice as large, right? Twice as tall, actually. Your cycle time is going to stay roughly the same, 50 or 60. Okay, I think I got that right. <laughs> now, to make DC, we need diodes, which come in two basic types, vacuum tube rectifiers and solid state PN junctions. Now, the silicon revolution gave us an amazing um, miniature version of a tube rectifier. But we're going to look at a whole bunch of them, and Charles is going to do the tubes for you. So 
Why don't you jump in here, Charles? Okay. So let's take a look at a couple of the more common types of tube rectifiers that you would see nowadays. This one is a beautiful new old stock, new in box, 5U3C. So this is a Soviet made tube, except that isn't actually a U. So this is pronounced TS, T-S. It's kind of hard to pronounce. Uh, we were laughing about it earlier. Though commonly online you'll see this denoted as a C in the American or English alphabet. The C, confusingly enough, is an S. So you'll see these uh, labeled as 5C3S. And what these actually are is a 5U4G rectifier tube. So let's take a quick look at it. We've got one of these beautiful old cardboard boxes. And the tube is nicely held in there. And there is a beautiful... Svetlana made tube. It's got great getter flashing on here, that nice wing C logo, and we see two big plates. And we see two plates because we want to rectify both halves of that AC sine wave. So one plate is for one for the positive half and one plate is for the negative half. And that's how you can tell that this is what's called a full wave rectifier. It's going to rectify the full wave to a DC signal. So that's a 5U4G equivalent. Here's an American-made 5U4GB. Made by GE. We have these beautiful, big, chunky plates, but in a straight bottle this time. And these guys are just a higher-end version of a 5U4G. They can put out a bit more current. So there's a couple of standard ones that you would see, um, fairly commonly in guitar amplifiers and some other equipment. Let's take a look at something a little less common. Okay, so we've got another military box here. This one is a 5R4 WGB made by Raytheon. We've looked at these guys before on screen, but they're such a neat tube. And of course, we're talking about rectifiers, so how could we leave this out? They're also known by a different name, which is pretty obvious once you take a look at them. They're called the Potato Masher. And judging by the thickness and the weight of this thing, you could probably mash some potatoes with it, no problem. And still plug it in and it would work. <laughs> and still plug it in and it would work. And you see, again, we've got those two big chunky plates on there. So this is another full wave rectifier. And this guy was designed for high altitude aircraft and high voltages and high current. So this will actually do more current than the other tubes we were just looking at. It's less commonly used in, in consumer equipment, but I think it is used in some, right? Well, no consumer equipment would ever come out with oh. that version of the tube. But, of course. But it's equivalent to the consumer 5R4. Mm -hmm. And we do have customers that would prefer to have the higher spec rectifier tube in their system, even though they they really are ugly. <laughs> ah, I think they're really neat looking. Ugly. <laughs> Anyways, we sell quite a few of them. I, we got really lucky. I, I bought a very large collection a couple of years ago. And the gentleman had, oh, I think he had about 50 of them, so. Yeah, so there's some examples of full wave rectifiers. Here's something that's a little bit less common. So the last tubes we were just looking at are what's called a directly heated rectifier. And that's where the heater and the cathode are one and the same. These are examples of indirectly heated. So just like other modern tubes, you'll have a separate heater and you'll have a cathode. This is a 6X4, also known as the EZ90, and this was made by Philips. Also, it's a Mullard tube, which is really nice. And of course, Philips own Mullard, so. Mm -hmm. And it has a really interesting double plate arrangement in there where they've made it into this sort of cross shape. Let's see if I can get that on camera a little bit better here. It's a nice looking little tube, and this is another full wave rectifier that was used in small radio equipment. And here we've got a Westinghouse 6AU4GTA. And this one is another indirectly heated tube, but we only have one plate on the inside. And the reason for that is that we only rectify one half of the wave with this tube. So this is the equivalent of a single diode right here. Yeah, and a lot of early equipment only needed uh, coarse half wave rectification. 
it still gave you DC, but it gave you a pretty rough DC. Mm -hmm. And then later on, of course, when full wave equipment came along, um, they would just plug two of those in. Yeah. And then eventually they put two tubes in a bottle. <laughs> that seemed like, I bet you that seemed like magic when that happened. Oh, probably. <laughs> so, there's some examples of a few different tube rectifiers that you'll see in the wild. Okay. What else do we have here? Thanks, Charles. Well, I've got... I've got a miniature diode here to show you. Now, this is our most commonly used um, diode in our um, kit amps, and it's a UF4007, which stands for ultra fast. So, ultra fast switching, um, and the 4007 is the highest number in the series, it can handle up to a full amp. Whereas Charles was showing you um, one of these guys right here. Yeah, I mean, I think this is 250 milliamps. I think it's somewhere around there. Yeah, right? somewhere around there. So uh, it takes four of those tubes to get the rating of one of these diodes. And one of these diodes can handle up to a thousand volts. So it's not hard to see um, why I would, I would choose this for the kit amps. Now, if silicon diodes can handle so much current in such a small package for so little money, you might wonder why all power supplies don't use them. Well, the, most do. 99.999% of them do. However, there are a lot of vintage amps that were manufactured prior to the introduction of reliable silicon diodes. And so there you, they, they were originally built to use tube rectifiers. And in many cases, instrument amp designers still choose tube rectifiers for the influence they have on the sonics of those amps. The same properties, voltage sag, that can make a guitar amp sound great, are exactly the opposite for hi-fi amps. So, at Melatone Kits, we use uh, solid-state silicon diodes exclusively. Now that doesn't mean that we won't someday come out with a kit amp that will use a tube rectifier, but because we, I started off trying to come up with kits that were in, a, in an attractive sort of smallish package, but were in many ways put together traditionally, but in a way that you know the average uh, beginner could build their own amp basically at an affordable price and it needed to sound great. So, <laughs> fitting, whenever you put a tube rectifier into a chassis, you need space. And, um, and it increases cost, you've got an extra socket. So, that's really why we went this way. Uh, but and, and if you're doing a dual mono design, you would need two of these tubes. Oh my God, that's yeah. true. <laughs> I hadn't thought about that. Okay, that's right. But interestingly enough, we need eight of these for the preamps, for the dual mono preamps, mm -hmm. but they're so inexpensive and you tuck them into the little power supply board so easily, it really doesn't make any difference, does really, it? Really, yeah. It's a little extra solder work and we have to count to eight. <laughs> so that's not hard at all. So what's been happening over at Melatone Kits? Well, we finally caught up on shipping the GU50 kit mono blocks. That was a bit of a stressor. I like the ship rapidly, but we back ordered them. Um, and I thought, well, it'll take a week, two weeks to get them going. And then Christmas hit and Charles got sick. And wow, anyways, when there's only two of you running a company, it's easy to get jammed up. I can remember when it was just me and I was working 80 hours a week. Those were crazy days. I don't want to see them again. Okay, well, what came in this week? Well, this week was huge. Usually at, at, the, at the holiday season, the postal service gets jammed up, the courier services get jammed up, even my Amazon Prime deliveries got backed up a whole week. Um, so everything arrives in the week or two after Christmas. And, and this week was crazy. You should have seen the stuff that came in. And we're gonna look at some, so hang on a second. Charles, you wanna grab those? Yeah, I'll get these out of here. Okay, I'm going to start off with this Soviet era 6N23P. That's the English number. This is a Voskhod rocket. 
And you can always tell Voskhod tubes because they had this little rocket symbol across the top of the tube. These are direct replacements for the popular 6DJ... 6G, 6DJ8. <laughs> oh, thanks Charles. Um, tube. And these are all from 1979. Now why is that important? The tubes made earlier in the modern Soviet era tend to be better. Now actually that pretty much applies to uh, US made tubes, Canadian tubes, European tubes. The earlier the date of the manufacturer in general, the better. It's, I'm not sure how you could improve technology and, and decrease the quality at the same time. But that's what happened with vacuum tubes in the second era. Um, this modern era, unfortunately, the vast majority of tubes are inferior, in my opinion. There are exceptions, probably lots of exceptions, but there's lots of mediocre tubes being made today, um, unfortunately. So a lot of these came into the store. Hang on. Some of my favorite, I got them paired up here. Let me get an elastic band. I've got some of my favorite 6SN7s. More of these came in. And this is the Sylvania 6SN7 GTA. I'm going to take a quick look at these. I've talked about them before. I love showing them off. It's though. hard to see the plates for the chrome there. The, this is the tube that replaced the famous bad boy, the lower spec GT. And so this is a modern spec 6SN7. And the plates are not angled. They're still straight and back to back like the famous bad boys. The Sonics are quite similar. They're not the same, but they're quite similar. In fact, almost all Sylvania um, triodes have what I call the Sylvania house sound, a warm, rich sound with varying amounts of detail. These have the, the warm, rich sound and the detail. And you can always tell if you've got one of the early tubes because you have a full chrome. It's like a, an overflow. It just slides down the side. And in this time period, these are from the 1950s, I think when manufacturers went to the smaller bottle, they weren't sure how much gettering they were going to need and or weren't sure about their vacuum equipment. So they just put a lot of gettering in. And the gettering, of course, helps absorb any stray gas molecules and maintain as close to a perfect vacuum as they can. So a whole bunch of these are in the store now. When I have to plug... Uh, a 6SN7 into our universal kit preamp, this is the tube of choice for me. I, When it comes to jazz, world jazz, um, acoustic music, vocal, these rule supreme. Okay, now I saved the best to last. So hang on a second. Let me get them out. Now, this is another Soviet era tube. This is a true Svetlana KT88. And um, the, the plant was in St. Petersburg, Russia. And um, the tube has many, many copies. And I was actually going to dig out some fakes and copies, but I didn't. So, <laughs> well, we, we had some requests for doing a show showing all those different we, fakes. That's too, right. So. We have to do it. Now, some of them are just reissues. So they're not fakes. The reissues will have round holes in the plate. So that's a giveaway right away. Those are made at the old reflector plant in Saratov, Russia. And that's the, the modern tube. This is the original vintage tubes. Unfortunately, Svetlana closed in the early 2000s. And this is my favorite KT-88, bar none. It, it has the same bit of warmth in the mid-range that the 6550C does, another tube that I specialize in, but it's got more punch, it's got more drive, it's got better bass. The problem is, is they didn't, Svetlana didn't make nearly as many of these tubes, and I I specialize them in, and I think I make three or four quads a year. They're expensive. They cost me a lot of money to buy. And unfortunately, I need to have a lot in inventory to match quads. But these have been in my system now for a couple of days. So I've got some hours on them, and they are rock solid. They're high testing, and uh, I, just, I just love them to death. Okay, well, 
If you stay to the very end, here's some discount codes to help you out. And remember, we've got $20 flat rate shipping around the world. And if you order $150 and more, the shipping is on us. And we've added a second secret code. Now there's one code that would be really easy to figure out that sort of comes next, right? Okay, that's as much of a hint as I'm going to give you. The next code, you have to spend some serious bucks and then you can use that code. So that's as much of a hint as I'm going to give you. Stay safe everyone. This is Jim and Charles signing off. Cheers everyone.